Turn it over to Simon Steele. Uh, and it's now recording. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Um, it, virtually anyway. I wish I was in Cambridge physically. Um, but I am stuck here in the early morning in, in the Silicon Valley, um, which is where the SETI Institute is. We have some uh, impressive neighbors who have a little bit more money than our little nonprofit organization. It's uh, LinkedIn's down the road and and Apple and NVIDIA, which isn't doing too well, apparently, today, uh, done by the stock market. Um, so yeah, I'm what I'm going to do is just give a, an overview of of the SETI Institute. Um, some of you may be more familiar with the Institute than others. Um, and then I'm gonna say a little bit about an education program that has been running for four years now, um, uh, which is called the NASA Community College Network. It's part of the SIACT um, program out of SMD. Um, I know there are some film, <laughs> familiar SIACTers here online. So, uh, um, you know, I, hopefully I will, uh, uh, talk properly about SIACT. Um, please feel free to um, ask questions, raise your hand uh, during the talk. It's um, These things can turn sort of quite formal when, when everyone's just sitting in boxes. Um, but uh, if you have any questions, please do um, interrupt and we can chat. Uh, otherwise, you know, we, we can talk at the end. So I'm going to, uh, rather than you looking at my face, I'm going to bring up my slides and uh, Cindy, make sure that this is a, let me know if these aren't coming up properly because uh, it never works when you're live. So. Okay. How's that looking? Perfect. Perfect, good. Okay, so um, as, uh, as Cindy said, this is the 40th anniversary of the SETI Institute. It was founded on November the 20th, 1984. Um, and uh, it's been growing ever since. The uh, SETI Institute was originally part of NASA Ames, which is, again, just down the street here, um, and then became an independent uh, research organization with just one scientist, Jill Tata, back in 1984, and it's since been growing. Um, and we now have about uh, almost 100 um, scientists doing various uh types of research, and I'll come back to that in a, in a moment. But first of all, a little selfie uh, of me with our uh, telescope array. This is These are three of the 42 um, dishes um, for the uh, radio telescope facility in Northern California um, that is the only uh, radio telescope facility designed to search for techno signatures, that is uh, technical uh, or technology signatures from alien civilizations. Uh, why one is facing completely the wrong direction, I don't know. And they're also going to ruin it soon because it, uh, they found a 43rd dish. Um, and so it'll no longer be 42, which is very, very disappointing. And so I think we're going to organize a campaign to sabotage the arrival of the 43rd. Um, I presume everybody gets that reference, so I won't say <laughs> anything more about it. Um, uh, the Institute uh, was founded by Jill Tata uh, up there on the left. Uh, Jill is retired now, but but still still on the board of trustees. A couple of other alums of the Institute um, in the center is Carl Sagan, who is on the board of trustees, and, and Frank Drake, who was instrumental, obviously, in SETI, um, the, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, Frank and Carl, of course, have been involved in in uh, 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 techno signatures for a, for a long, long time. Uh, they were both responsible for the the golden record that's on the side of the Voyager spacecraft. Um, uh, Frank, uh, for those of you who have heard of the Arecibo message, uh, which was a, a, a coded message sent to Messier thirteen back in the the seventies. Um, uh, it's actually the the uh, uh, 50th anniversary of the Arecibo message, which is which is quite cool. Um, both or all three of them involved in in the institute. Um, Frank Drake also has came up with the uh, famous or infamous Drake equation, um, and there's a nice picture of him writing it on the board and and the Drake equation laid out uh, below. I am. Assume that people have heard of the Drake equation, uh, even if they're not not familiar with the terms. Um, it, it was actually 
uh, written down by Frank as an agenda to a meeting back in the early 60s. It wasn't actually designed to be an experiment, uh, uh, an equation to be solved, although you can solve it by putting numbers in. It was more of a, a roadmap to um, uh, research to try and answer the question of N equals, that is how many um, communicating alien civilizations are there in our Milky Way at this current time. Uh, this equation, um, we have a nice big neon sign at the front of the building, uh, which everyone has their photograph taken next to, uh, really um, has been adopted as a roadmap to the research of the SETI Institute. And so what I might do is use this equation and go through the terms to just to talk about the research at, at the SETI Institute um, because it, it's no longer and hasn't been for quite a while just searching for intelligent aliens. Um, it uh, is an institute searching for all forms of life in the universe. There's a couple of reasons for that. One is obviously uh, life in all of its forms are fascinating and, and obviously uh, interrelated. Um, but the other uh, reason is that uh, uh, the US government, federal government, um, uh, canceled or banned the funding of searching for anything more intelligent than microbes. And so from the, uh, there's a, a US senator whose name eludes me, um, decided, he was a Democrat, uh, apparently, um, that uh, spending money searching for intelligent aliens was a waste of, of money, waste of taxpayer money, and just, just uh, really not very smart, in, interestingly. Um, and so from that moment in the, the 90s, uh, uh, NASA has never funded um, a research program that is to search for intelligent life. It does a lot of searching for basic life, uh, Mars rovers, uh, Europa Clipper are all uh, having their sort of mission statement searching for, for life in the universe. Um, but as long as that life is not thinking uh, and capable of building technology, then, then NASA's okay with it. Uh, I, I'll come back to one uh, that we have found a loophole in that, and I'll come back to that in, in a second. So I'm just going to go through the Drake equation as an excuse to show pretty pictures and also to talk about the research uh, at the Institute. And then at the end, we'll, we'll switch over to, to, uh, to the education component. Um, so I suppose I can't see people's hands, but um, is there anyone, raise your hands, who is not familiar with the Drake equation? Because that will determine how fast I move down it. <laughs> OK. Good. So you're all familiar with Drake equation. So anyway, so um, n equals number of uh, communicating intelligent civilizations depends on a lot of parameters. Of course, it goes. You know, the the model of the equation goes back to uh, I think it was Fermi's um, famous question: uh, How many piano tuners are there in Chicago? Um, you you actually uh, who could possibly be able to answer that question off the top of your head? Um, how many piano tuners are there? Well, that's unanswerable until you break it down in, into parameters. Um, how many people in Chicago? How many of those people live in houses? Uh, how many pianos per, per house and so on? And you can gradually um, build up an idea to get an estimate for, for an apparently unanswerable uh, question. And so that's the idea of the Drake equation. And so I'm going to just run through all these terms um, and talk about them very briefly individually. So. Uh, it's also an excuse, as I say, to, to bring up very pretty pictures, especially the first one. And you've got the equation down the bottom. This is, of course, a, the JWST image of the uh, Pillars of Creation, the Eagle Nebula. Um, and what's interesting is, of course, all of these have become logical. If, if you're going to, if you're going, and again, going back to the, the wonderful phrase from, from Carl Sagan, which we use in the Cosmic Questions exhibit, um, if you're going to, uh, build an apple pie, first you must invent the universe. And so if you're going to have communicating intelligent aliens, you need somewhere for them to live. And in order to start off that process, you need to make stars, because as far as we know, stars and then planets are, are probably the best place for, for aliens to, to, to start evolving from. Um, so the rate of star formation in our Milky Way is, is the first term of, of uh, the Drake equation. And it's the only one that's uh, certainly until very recently that anyone had any idea what to put the numbers in for. 
um, uh, uh, there's about seven solar masses worth of stars made in our Milky Way uh, every um, year. Uh, and that's pretty much well understood. And, and of course, studying um, uh, star forming regions like uh, uh, like this one is is the way you figure that out. Um, we do have a couple of uh, uh, scientists studying star formation, uh, which is which is good. It's probably the most underrepresented um, term of the Drake equation at the institute. Although I I did my research in in star formation, so maybe I can claim this as my term. Um, we do have a, a scientist, um, uh, and I bring this up, uh, Jong Hee Ro, who uses a uh, James Webb Space Telescope to analyze um, star death rather than star formation. This is a, a, a beautiful JWST image of, of um, Cassiopeia A, a supernova remnant. And apart from bringing this up to show uh, how beautiful this is, um, uh, it's actually taken from one of our YouTube videos to do a bit of advertising. Uh, we do weekly shows on YouTube called SETI Live, uh, and this was from last week, um, getting scientists on uh, from the Institute and from elsewhere to talk about the latest discoveries. And so um, we are very happy to link link this video to, to our YouTube channel as well, sort of cross-pollination cross there. Um, but uh, take a look if you're interested in these, these uh, science videos that we run uh, every week. Um, there's one tomorrow, I think. Next term of the, the equation, um, F sub P, which is, uh, so we've got all these stars being born. What fraction of those stars actually have planets? Um, until the late 90s, uh, there was, a, unless you were a huge Star Trek fan, um, uh, you, we don't know. Um, what's fascinating, of course, is that uh, the Star Trek fans were turned out to be right, and uh, a lot of stars have planets going around them. Um, and in fact, uh, statistically now, I think we're up to about 5,000 uh, exoplanets discovered plus or minus in our uh, galaxy. Um, a lot of those are multiple uh, planetary systems. And um, it turns out if you extrapolate out, uh, pretty much most stars in our galaxy have planets going around them. The exceptions are some of these very large sort of O-type stars, B-type stars that the, the, the stellar winds are so much, they don't blow the, their surrounding nebulae off anyway. But they don't last long, so, so there's, they aren't good places to search for life. But pretty much every other uh, star system may well have a, uh, planets going around them, including binary star systems, which is really cool. This is a, a, an artist's impression, of course, of, of um, a test-discovered object, TOI 1338b, um, this was discovered by uh, a SETI Institute scientist, um, Veselin Kostov. Um, uh, the SETI Institute has been involved in exoplanet searches uh, since the very beginning. We, we uh, uh, hosted the data pipeline for the Kepler mission and now have uh, scientists working with TESS. And this TOI, TESS object of interest, turned out, turns out to be a binary star system. Um, with a planet going around it and uh, became known famously in the press as, as the Tatooine world uh, because it sort of looks like um, uh, uh, where Luke is, is from. So, um, but if binary star systems, obviously dynamically you need, you need a really sort of nice setup for that. Either the stars have to be very, very close in or the stars have to be very far apart so the planets can, can orbit uh, stably. But if binary star systems can host planets as well, you're really now talking, you know, 100 billion uh, stars plus that can have planets going around them. So there is no shortage of planets. Um, and now with the technology improving to discover Earth-like planets, Earth-sized planets, uh, things are really taking off. And so we now actually not only have planets to look for life, but we also have planets to point our radio telescopes at. Uh, to see if there's any transmissions coming out of them, which is very, very exciting. <clears throat> Term number three. Um, so you have all those those planets. What fraction of those planets are Earth-like? Uh, what do we mean by Earth-like planets? That's a, that's a good question because Venus is very Earth-like. Um, sort of same size, uh, same density, 
uh, roughly the same distance from 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 the sun, a little bit closer, but it is definitely not the place you look for life on. Um, has very very unpleasant situations. Uh, uh, certainly the surface. There were some discoveries of, of as phosphine molecules in the atmosphere. I don't think those are holding up anymore. Um, so so Venus is definitely not Earth like. Um, what's interesting is the the most Earth like planets that is planets uh supporting potentially supporting life you could include mars in that but in the solar system you're beginning to look at the the moons of the gas giants uh, because out in the uh outer regions of the solar system you have you have icy moons but due to tidal heating of those moons you actually have a situation where you can melt the interior ice into into warm salt oceans uh, and this image on the right is is an image of Europa um, that may well be visited soon, um, as long as they get Europa Clipper off the ground. Uh, I know there's been problems with its with its with its chips um, that that don't seem to be as radiation hardened as they they should have been. Uh, but uh, fingers crossed that will be launched um, uh, in October uh, to Europa. Um, the SETI Institute has uh, uh, mission scientists on the Europa mission as well, obviously, because we're looking for, for biosignatures or, or signatures of, of biology, of life or prebiotic life um, in the uh, sort of the, the crevices um, on Europa. The image on the left is not Europa, or they could be. Uh, this is an image from the uh, uh, plate boundary uh, just off the coast of Oregon. And it's the, these uh, famous black smokers uh, that you get in ocean vents where you get a, a, a geothermal uh, heating and a lot of uh, um, uh, nutrients um, and incredible diversity of life around these regions, even though there's no sunlight. And this is a good model, perhaps, for what's happening at the, at the base of these ocean worlds. And um, uh, we have a scientist, uh, Pablo Sabron, who designs submarines uh, to go down to these uh, ocean vents and perform um, Raman spectroscopy, uh, that is shining laser beams at, at, at these vents to, to measure their molecular content, um, to get an estimate on, on the, the, the types of uh, molecules that are being uh, discharged from these black smokers. And the idea there, of course, is that this is the type of robot submarine that you would want to put on Europa uh, and, and uh, Enceladus around Jupiter, uh, around Saturn, and um, get those down into the oceans and uh, measure the, the chemical composition. So, so although they're doing some good science um, off uh, the coast of our oceans, the ultimate goal is to put these uh, systems uh, down into the oceans of the ocean worlds in the outer uh, solar system. So why am I rambling on about Europa and Enceladus? Because uh, if you think about what we mean by Earth-like. Um, uh, there is only one Earth in our solar system, but if you've got these potential ocean worlds around the Jovian uh, planets in the outer solar system, you not you can put that N uh, up from one, two, three. Um, uh, Ganymede has a liquid ocean. You can probably get about to half a dozen uh, the types of, of uh, uh, planets or moons in our solar system. And if you can do it in our solar system, you can you can knock up that number probably in other planetary systems as well. Vanessa, hi. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. I guess probably not the hot Jupiters, but other Jupiters out there may have moons like Europa with some suspicious characteristics is kind of what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. It's still early days, of course. Um, you know, we're just beginning to, to with JWST, managing to sort of measure the atmospheric compositions of the, the larger planets. Um, but, uh, you know, I think, um, you know, we, we hear about habitable zones, the Goldilocks region around stars, which is true. That's where you need to be if, if, you, if you've got a, a planet to have liquid water on the surface. But um, that does not necessarily apply if you're looking at, at, at outer planets and, and, and uh, large gas giant moons. Next term, I mean, these are the sort of easy ones. Uh, what, what you know, the first half of the Drake equation is is nice. You know, it's all it's all figured out. That's okay, uh, and you, you're almost there. We've almost figured out how many aliens there are 
and then you sort of hit the next term in the equation. So um, uh, F sub L, um, the fraction of those worlds where life actually emerges and suddenly you're in trouble uh, because the definitions, and I'm not a, not a biologist, let alone an astrobiologist, and so I hope there's no biologist online, but basically um, even defining what life is, um, let alone figuring out how it's emerging is, is tricky. Uh, and so what you need to do is, is try and identify a life from lifelessness. Um, and the best way to do that, the best way to think about where to look for life on other worlds is, is to look for Earth analogs. Um, you know, obviously forests are a great place to look for life, but uh, Mars does not have forests. What sort of locations on Mars should you be landing your rover? Uh, in order to find evidence for fossil life and so on. Um, this is a, a picture of our director of, of, uh, of uh, science, uh, Nathalie Cabral. Uh, she's an astrobiologist, and she's standing in the Atacama Desert here um, in Chile. Uh, very high altitude, um, one of the driest places on Earth, uh, one of the places that has one of the highest UV fluxes on Earth. Because, uh, because of your altitude, um, you really cannot uh, expose your skin to this area because of the, the ultraviolet radiation. And so one of the most inhospitable places on our planet also happens to be reasonably um, teeming with, with microbial life. Um, but it's not out on this surface because it gets fried and dried. Um, it is in fissures in rocks um, and different, different locations um, just beneath the surface. And uh, looking at where life is in extreme places on Earth will give you an idea of where to look for life in uh, extreme places on other planets. Um, Natalie is an expert in, in uh, high deserts. Uh, we currently have a scientist diving under the ice in Antarctica. Um, and uh, uh, another one up in the Arctic uh, modeling um, the, the sort of uh, northern uh, uh, terrains uh, just in northern Canada, um, because these are the sort of extreme conditions you will find on places like Mars. And it's a good way to test your experiments and a good way to, to think when you choose to put your lander down, um, where can you find a similar looking terrain? Uh, of course, we've uh, the latest Mars rover uh, is driving around a, a, um, a former um, delta structure um, and shallow lake, which will be a great place to look for fossils. So um, what is life is a tricky thing to answer. Where you look for it might be slightly easier. Um, uh, and that's something that there's quite an active research program uh, at the Institute. OK, you've got some life, which is great. Um, what fraction of that life actually uh, becomes intelligent? Um, we've got lots of life on this Earth. It took you know about 3 billion years for anything to emerge beyond microbes, but now we have a, a planet basically swarming with intelligent life. Um, how do we find, define intelligence is another question. Um, we think we're intelligent. Um, Judith's laughing, I, you know, humans, humans sometimes are intelligent. Um, but there are other uh, life forms on Earth that are also intelligent, which means that there are a different sort of evolutionary branches that can produce intelligence. It doesn't have to go into some things that are human. Uh, whales obviously are very closely related to us and are incredibly intelligent. Um, bees are intelligent in communicating the source of food. Um, even um, had a wonderful tour of the redwood forests uh, here in, in California and all the trees talk to each other. Um, they share nutrients. When a tree gets sick, the other trees send nutrients. I mean, that's that's pretty smart, you know, that, that's survival and, and cooperation. Um, and so intelligence seems to be pretty much everywhere. Um, actually, the, talking to intelligence, as we come to the, the next, next term in a second, is, is something that's quite important because how do we actually recognize what is being said or even if anything's being said? Uh, we have a, a scientist here, uh, Lawrence Doyle, who can now have conversations with whales, which is quite amazing. Um, he uses information theory to analyze the, the, um, the singing of whales. 
and uh, can actually uh, determine pretty much what they're saying. And he actually claims uh, with scientific um, integrity that he's heard whales argue about um, how well they're doing their fishing. Uh, humpback whales, like shown here, uh, can work as a team to create what are called bubble nets. They, they, they blow bubbles, um, which corral the small fish um, up in the, the, the Alaskan uh, waters. And then as they corral the fish, the whales can then uh, sweep up through those fish and eat them. But that can't be done by an individual whale. It has to be done by groups of whales. And they're, they're not necessarily the same family. Um, they can be you know, uh, uh, from the same group, but uh, not necessarily related. And they talk to each other. Um, they, they complain when somebody uh, lets the side down, um, uh, which is quite incredible. Um, and of course, we know that the whales can communicate over vast distances, um, thanks to, to, to sound transmission in, in water. Um, uh, so an obvious example of intelligence. But depending on how broadly you define intelligence, it seems to be certainly on Earth, something that emerges um, uh, in various different aspects in various different uh evolutionary lines and that's good because what you want for this fraction is 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 to be quite high you don't want uh, an entire planet of billions of of, of different types of animals uh, and only one of them can actually uh develop intelligence um, and the it looks as though that's not the case for the earth and uh maybe not the case for other planets as well so that is an active uh area of, of research here um, but that brings us to the penultimate term, which is what the SETI Institute was, was founded for. Um, and it's always good, any excuse to put up a picture of Jodie Foster, of course. Uh, uh, Jodie Foster from CONTACT, that's the, the uh, sadly, the, the Arecibo Observatory that is no more uh, behind her head. Um, the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico was was the telescope that was used to to send the Arecibo message by Frank Drake back in 1974, um, and it was also used as a set for the movie Contact, which was written by Carl Sagan, um, and uh, Jodie Foster's character was modeled on Jill Tata, the founder of the SETI Institute. So, it's uh, um, she's actually going to participate in our 40th anniversary apparently, which is very very exciting. So uh, that's okay. That's enough. That's enough. Jodie Foster worship. Um, basically, um, the SETI Institute was was founded to search for techno signatures. You were on camera. Oh, hi, Owen. <laughs> um, uh, this is this is a view of the Hat Creek Radio Observatory up in up in Northern California. Um, there's a few more of the dishes, and uh, with a picture of the control room. It looks nicer weather here. It was um, very closely um, almost affected by the latest large fire that we had in, in um, California, the campfire, which uh, burnt. Um, it got within about 40 kilometers of uh, the, the uh, radio telescope facility, but, but fortunately did not hurt it. So this um, radio telescope, as I say, is the only one dedicated to uh, technosignature searches um, although other telescopes like Arecibo and now the v uh, VLA in New Mexico are also being used by SETI Institute scientists um, to uh, do technosignature um, uh, 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 studies, uh, not only doing sort of all sky surveys, but also uh, picking out individual exoplanet systems and and doing a monitoring of that especially the the nearby systems where you are just within range of picking up uh leakage um that is sort of random uh uh, uh transmissions from from a, an intelligent uh civilization now you know just if you if you remember the movie contact of course our tv shows and radio things and and radio transmissions from satellites are all leaking into space and so we're sort of polluting uh the 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 universe with our radio noise that fades out pretty quickly uh you you would need to be within you know a few tens of light years to actually pick out radio leakage from from a civilization um but we can do it for the closest stars and of course as proxima centauri has a planet you know they could be very close by 
Um, no evidence yet. Uh, but if you get a beamed signal, uh, for example, the Arecibo telescope was a radar, it was a transmitter. Uh, most radio telescopes are, just, are passive receivers, but, but Arecibo is a, is a transmitter. Um, uh, a, a beamed transmission from something equivalent to Arecibo can now be detected pretty much across from the far side of our galaxy uh, by, by uh, the VLA in New Mexico and, and slightly lesser extent, uh, the Allen Telescope Array that, that you can see here. What that means is if you get a beamed transmission, uh, that is a, a, a directional transmission, um, that puts us within range of billions of stars and potentially billions of planets. And so, the big race is on almost uh, between searching for microbial life, which of course is is uh, the Mars rovers and the um, Europa Clipper and uh, JWST looking at planetary atmospheres. They, those are all searching for biosignatures. Um, but you can only do that to a certain distance out. Obviously, you can only uh, do rover missions to, to our solar system. There's probably more biological life than there is intelligent communicating life, but SETI techno signature searches can now reach the entire galaxy in theory. And so you've got a much bigger sample size. And so the question is, who's going to win? Who's going to, are we going to discover microbes first or are we going to discover alien civilizations first? Um, that's, a, that's a question uh, that remains to be answered. The last wonderful term in uh, Frank Drake's equation is, is um, L. L is the average lifetime of a communicating civilization. How long can you actually communicate um, before you stop communicating? Uh, there's an optimistic and a pessimistic answer to this. Um, and I put up a graph showing the pessimistic answer uh, because, you know, uh, civilizations may well um, reach a point where through um, self-neglect, uh, through war, through through pandemics, um, through climate change that damages their culture, um, stop uh, being able to or be willing to communicate or receive uh, signals. We've been a communicating civilization for about 80 years now. Um, so the value of L for the Drake equation for humanity is, is 80. Uh, we'd like it to get higher. Um, it would be nice if it got up into the hundreds or the thousands, and it may well do. Um, but the L component is quite a critical term in this equation because it can really put a dampener on everything, but it could also suggest that there's, there's a tremendous uh, range of uh, civilizations out there. There's an optimistic answer to L as well. Um, a civilization may become um, uncommunicative because their technology is so far advanced, we don't know how to listen to them. Uh, our technology is basic radio technology. Uh, we're also doing what's called optical SETI, detect, trying to detect laser pulses from alien civilizations, which is, which is a brand new uh, method. But at certain points, a civilization may become so far advanced uh, that that we may well be receiving a signal and we haven't a clue that we're receiving the signal. Um, uh, an example here of this, um, I think this was generated by by Dali or some chat GBT thing. It's it's beautiful. It's, this is a what's called a Dyson sphere. Um, and an advanced civilization has the capability of uh, encasing its entire star in in a in a uh, a sphere that can then uh, trap 100% uh, of its starlight in um, rather than the small percentage of starlight that we capture from our sun using solar panels. If you can capture the entire energy output of a star by surrounding it, encasing it in the sphere. Um, that sounds like science fiction, um, but uh, it's an interesting concept and something that you can actually search for uh, there's a graph on the left, which is from a star called Biagian star, which was looking, it was a Kepler source, where the star appeared to have these incredible dips in brightness. Um, 
and uh, too too deep to actually be due to a planet passing in front of it. And one of the possible solutions to that was that these are big lumps of Dyson sphere being constructed and drifting in front of the star. Now, that search for, for technology is something that NASA certainly would not want to put its money into. However, we have got a scientist on, on our books, uh, Amory Cody, who received a grant to study uh, test data um, from the, the test satellite to look for these anomalous dips with the possibility of detecting uh, uh, Dyson spheres under construction. And so this was a, a, a loophole in NASA, which is now going to be recorded on YouTube, um, to actually search for technologies um, uh, rather than just biosignatures. So what on earth um, does this mean? Uh, we don't know what n equals. I think Frank Drake famously said it was 10,000, but I don't think he justified uh, why he said 10,000. 10,000 alien civilizations out there in our galaxy. Um, the exciting thing, though, is that each one of these terms of the Drake equation, whereas uh, 30 years ago, when or 40 years ago, when it was founded, we only were capable of seriously analyzing the first term. Whereas now we have, can have scientists analyzing the entire sequence to try and figure out where uh, or if there are intelligences out there. I will pause for a second if anyone has any questions or comments on that. I say one of the sorry. Oh. Yeah. Hi. If you Hi. had to bet, yeah. Would you put your money on the intelligent life or the microbes finding first? Us finding them first. I I think um because of where I work, I'm gonna say the intelligence. Um <laughs> it's a it's a very good question, you know, and it, it sounds, oh, you know, how can you possibly equate those things? But it, it's interesting because both both techniques I have have different sort of weighting, you know, the, the, the intelligent civilizations are going to be maybe very far and few between, but you have this huge sample size where you can analyze. Um, biology should be everywhere. There's, there's no reason why biology shouldn't be as, as, you know, as universal as chemistry or physics. Um, uh, but, you know, you only have a limited number of places you can actually, uh, when shaking his head. Yeah. I, <laughs> You only have a limited uh, number of, of of samples planets that you can actually get to 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 find that out. So who knows? Right. So for microbes, like, would the evidence have to be that you're you're there and you have found it, or like, are there signatures that we could detect from Earth that would confirm that there are microbes on another planet? Yeah, well, I I think I mean obviously it would be nice to to pick up and that's what the point of Mars sample return of course which which again is not clear you know that that's going to take a while to to get going. Um uh what you're probably going to be doing is looking for what are called biosignatures looking at looking at uh, traces both you know on Europa and in the atmosphere as a planet of uh, for for gases mainly um that that imply uh, some sort of organic behavior. Uh, so, it, you know, the question is how clear cut will they be? Uh, we'll have to wait and see, see what, what comes up. Thank you. Yeah. Vanessa, you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, you know, the news can often be sens sensational about these things, but, uh, I seem to recall there being some record of, yep. Either I mean, microbes or um, building blocks of microbes, they might have rather theatrically said, um, oh, okay. found on meteorites or... Yeah, I'm going to move stuff um, out of the area so you'll have plenty of place. Um, okay, yes, that would be good. Can we mute this person? All right, Eric, to, uh, yeah. you're on mute there. Oh, thanks, thanks. Um, yeah, so I've, I've heard that... Um, Either microbes or building blocks of microbes can be found on, say, asteroids or meteorites or something along those lines. This is like a half-remembered memory of uh, a news article. 
I'm curious if people have a clear memory of whatever the heck that finding was. There was uh, quite a while ago, there was the, the Martian meteorite ALH84001, triple oh one. Um, that was discovered in Antarctica that that appeared to have um, fossilized um, uh, remnants of of of, of bacteria, uh, and I think that 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 caused a little bit of a stir uh, for a while. And it turns out they probably were were mineral generated rather than uh, biologically generated. I think there's a lot of chemicals out there. I mean, it, it's amazing. You know, some of the uh, the finding amino acids and and so on and you know and uh organics in in comets so certainly there's no shortage of the building blocks uh the the trick is to get them together to actually form something more complex and uh for that you need a planet um uh to start building them i know you know the, there's a the the panspermia ideas uh, i think fred hoyle was the first one to come up with with uh those ideas of actually distributing uh the seeds of life across uh, the galaxy but I, I think to actually make things that are functionally uh, biological, you actually need a, a reasonably stable planet um, and the right conditions. Right. I remember part of the, um, I didn't know the name Hoyle, but that uh, people talking about, I forget whether they sometimes talk about biogenesis or abiogenesis, or if those are two ways of saying the same thing, but that one of the running theories is that life was introduced to Earth from elsewhere because they've yet to find a mechanism to produce it here mm. past the debunking of some of the like proposed methods in the past. Um, yeah, I'm not sure where the state of the art is on that either. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm I'm not sure either. I mean, what's in, I mean, there, there's always this, a conversation about if you find life on Mars, it, was it an independent um, a genesis of life or was there cross-fertilization between Mars and Earth? I mean, stuff is is raining down on the Earth from Mars and vice versa all the time. And and there is a possibility of of that idea that that you can end up with, with um, uh, a biology from one of those worlds impacting on the other one. Um, that's one of interesting uh, aspect to Europa because Europa orbiting around Jupiter is in such a deep potential well due to Jupiter that you cannot um, get stuff from Europa to the inner solar system uh, in any sort of feasible way. And so any discovery of, of um, a, you know, biogenesis on Europa or any of the other uh, gas giant moons has to be independent. Of, of the inner solar system. And so that 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 would be, you know, an exciting definitive proof, if, you, if there's ever such thing as definitive proof in science um, of an independent uh, genesis of life. Um, Mars and Earth are always going to be slightly ambiguous, I think. Um, Cindy, I realize we're, we're running short on time. I'm just going to move on quickly. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to skip the, the next slide. Uh, we're actually going to run a, a role-playing game um, on uh, First Contact. And maybe I'll report back out on that another time. Maybe I'll come and run it uh, at the at, uh, the CFA. This is, this is a game uh, developed by the Logistics Exercise and Simulation Directorate. Uh, that is, uh, the US military uh, have run uh, war, uh, 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 war gaming simulations, although they're not war games. Um, on on uh, how governments respond to to first contact with um, top members of the government, and we're going to play that game uh, next month, and I'll let you know how it goes. Um, but that's that's quite interesting. Um, I'm going to say a little quick thing about uh, their education program. Uh, the SETI Institute is a nonprofit organization. All of our scientists have have to bring in their own funding. Um, uh, we do not. It's unlike a university. We we do not have uh, undergraduates. We do not uh, have any teaching. Um, so every scientist has to bring in their own grants. And that's true for the education uh, center as well. Um, and all of the education programming uh, that we have the Institute are external funding. Uh, we have one NSF program. It's, a, it's an REU program uh, for summer interns. Uh, the other two education programs we have running at the moment are SIACT programs. Uh, one is called the Astronomy and Astronomy. Astronomy Activation Ambassadors, I, I, I stumble over that because it used to be called the Airborne Astronomy Ambassadors, uh, where we uh, uh, developed a, a PD 
for high school teachers who flew on the Sophia um, uh, uh, 747. Uh, when that was retired, it had to be redesigned. Um, the other main program we have is uh, the NASA Community College Network, um, which is a program to support the teaching of astronomy in community colleges. Um, uh, I'll go through this the slide or these slides quickly because, of course, this is being recorded and you can go back and spend your, your Sunday afternoon enjoying this presentation again. Um, but the, the, the motivation for, for this program is really to, to uh, support uh, astronomy teaching of which about 40% is done at community college uh, every year. Um, and, uh, and therefore you're reaching um, over 100,000 students who are going uh, teaching, uh, learning astronomy. Now, a lot of these will be the intro Astro 101 type courses. A lot of the students will not be uh, STEM majors. And so effectively what you're doing is you're reaching these students with the last science course they will ever take in their lives. And therefore the, 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 the idea of science literacy uh, for these students is incredibly important. Um, community colleges, you can see that the, the importance of reaching this particular um, demographic. Uh, uh, there's a lot of data there from the uh, American Association of Community Colleges, but uh, first generation to attend college, 29% of, of community college students, uh, uh, first generation, single parents, uh, veterans, um, uh, mature students are all taking uh, uh, classes at community college. And, and in an informal survey, um, the astronomy classes pretty much reflect the demographic of the college. And so these, these demographics here are represented in astronomy classes. What we also know is that only 23% of instructors teaching astronomy at community college have degrees in astronomy. And therefore, um, giving them support both in material and in professional development, uh, uh, we think is, is vital. And that's why uh, NCCN was one of the SIAX 2.0 teams that was funded. We're now four years into a five-year program, um, which, which uh, is gonna make 2025 very interesting as we try to continue this program. And, and as, as Pat knows, <laughs> uh, just a little bit about NCCN. Uh, we currently have 206 community college instructors over 38 states. Uh, and we also have um, 114 subject matter experts, SMEs from uh, across the US as well. The little little orange telescopes are where the colleges are. Um, the, the rocket ships are, are where the subject matter experts are. Um, I, I've got a link to the, the our website in the end, and this is a clickable map. Um, so uh, the subject matter experts can offer their assistance to um, uh, the instructors in various ways. I'll come to that in the next slide. Um, uh, but one of the ways is to give webinars. We had uh, Jonathan Slavin from, from the CFA give a presentation um, uh, a couple of months ago. So we've got a few CFA people and Mary, of course, and, and uh, 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 Frank um, gave us a, an overview of, of micro observatory as well. Uh, NCCN has these these ways it, it it works, and we work with the instructors. We don't work with the students. We hope that it ultimately reaches the students, but this is this is really to support the instructors. Um, we we have a set of ready to go resources, curated resources, um, in a searchable database that is much better than NASA's searchable database for resources. To be quite honest, um, no bias there. Um, we provide PD training and webinars um, for both the community college instructors and the subject matter experts to give them an idea of what it's like to be in a community college, which is very different from four year colleges. I mean, I'm learning that, you know, I, I spent my life in four year colleges and, and, and community colleges are different in, in wonderful ways, but also in difficult ways as well. Um, we broker direct partnerships between the the uh, the scientists and the community college instructors, either giving a presentation in the classroom or just getting on a Zoom call and chatting about a, a particular topic that they're going to teach. Um, you know, uh, they may be a very uh, well versed in in the solar system, but if you're going to have to teach cosmology, uh, maybe a little bit of of help on on talking about um, uh, the more extreme areas of, of astrophysics. Uh, going back to our old um, Beyond the Solar System uh, PD uh, program uh, back back in my day. 
Um, what we found was very, very important is we provide a community of practice. It turns out that most astronomers at community colleges are the only astronomer there. They have no nobody to talk to, nobody, <laughs> no shoulder to cry on. Um, and so uh, the community of practice has turned out to be one of the most useful uh, ways that we can support them in, in providing this community. And uh, I think that's that's if anything, that's probably the most important thing that's come out of this network. Uh, these are just a few of uh, uh, quotations. I won't won't stay on this. Um, this is most of our um, evaluation, which is by WestEd, uh, is qualitative, not quantitative. Um, although we do measure, you know, how many uh, resources are accessed and so on, it's really looking at how NCCN is supporting their teaching um, in uh, uh, in the classroom. And so these are just a few of the quotes that have come up um, from uh, from the instructors uh, through um, interviews with with uh, WestEd. And um, on the whole, uh, they are very positive. Um, we also uh, interview the subject matter experts as well. And that on the whole has been positive. There is one aspect that we didn't think of when we started this program, which is which maybe with hindsight is obvious. Uh, we really wanted to protect the scientists from being inundated with requests. You know, you, we get, have somebody from uh, uh, Melissa McGrath, who's on the Europa Clipper mission. Uh, we didn't want her to be hit with with, you know, 200 uh, requests for, for talks um, uh, when Europa Clipper is being launched. And so we set up a, 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 a a matchmaking system that, that protects the scientists. And it turns out that all the scientists just sat there by their telephones waiting for calls that never came. Um, community college instructors do not have the time to factor in a scientist visit to their classroom. And so we have really had to think of new ways to engage all of these scientists that have volunteered to help us because we find it very, very difficult, with a few exceptions that have worked out incredibly well, very, very difficult to um, support um, in an active way community college instructors. We, I mean, we're meant to be a support and not a burden, but this idea that they, they are too busy to even seek um, this enhancement that we're offering is, was, was an interesting finding uh, from the program. Um, NCCN has, has sort of um, taken in uh, several other uh, programs. Um, it turns out that there's a lot of organizations that are very interested in working with community colleges and very excited. Uh, a lot of uh, scientists began their careers at community college. Um, and so there have been several uh, opportunities for us to support a, a wide range of program. And I'm just gonna go around the clock here and at one o'clock, of course, is 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 the other SIAC teams, um, uh, Pats and Marys and Franks. Um, we have also um, helped uh, some students at, at San Diego State and UCLA who were former community college students and now getting their PhDs in, in astronomy um, to set up local um, talks and support systems for, for careers for community colleges in their area, which is very exciting. Uh, um, Razzle, which is a, a, a survey um, a lunar exploration mission, uh, we are working with them to help their scientists engage in community college. And uh, moving down to the bottom, Muse, the multi-slit uh, solar explorer, which is a, a UV, extreme UV solar mission. Um, we are supporting their scientists um, in conjunction with the tribal community colleges in Montana, which is which is very exciting, and that's just getting started. A um, couple of others um, supporting uh, citizen science. You can supporting the AAS in the Shapley lectures. Our scientists um, uh, giving lectures at community colleges, paid for by AAS. And the last one is um, uh, a wonderful synergy between. NCCM, which is not SETI related, um, and the amateur di radio digital communications, ARDC, ham radio, basically. Um, we are supporting ARDC in uh, developing a curriculum on radio astronomy for community college students. Uh, and this is um, uh, 
uh, Rika French from Mara Costa College in San Diego, um, steering a radio telescope to measure the hydrogen lines, emission lines of the Milky Way as part of a workshop that uh, has been funded by ARDC Foundation. Um, and one of our SETI Institute scientists uh, has developed an eight-week module, uh, which is available to anyone. If anyone is interested in that module, it's still uh, being finalized. But that is a wonderful tie-in uh, for NCCN and the SETI Institute, um, whereas N NCCN is obviously broad astronomy. It's nice to have this, this relationship now with, with SETI and technosignatures uh, through this program. I will end there. Uh, there's a couple of links. Um, feel free to email me. Um, that's the link for the SETI Institute site and the NCCN site. Um, and obviously, any questions, um, be happy to answer. And I will try and end my slideshow now. Thank you, Simon, for such a fabulous presentation. And um, we did have a question in the chat of, as to, um, do you have any resources in other languages than English? We, uh, some of our materials are being generated in uh, Spanish. Um, we are wanting to generate uh, resources in, in multiple languages uh, moving forward, but um, it's, it's, it's lagging behind a little bit. Um, we're hoping that, that um, you know, the, the ARDC grant, the, the SETI uh, curriculum will be available in, in Spanish at least uh, as well. Um, so I think so, if, so some, has, so many. if Simon has time, we can take one or two questions. Oh, go ahead, Erwin. I've already asked a question. Okay. Erwin, did you have a question? Oh, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, go for it. Yes, yeah, and if, if you unmute, go ahead and ask. Erwin, we can't hear you. Can the host unmute Erwin? Lower left of your screen, there should be the little microphone audio button. Ah, you can hear me. Right. Oh, yes. Yes. Simon, I was wondering if you know anything about the radio telescope that was developed at the Haystack Observatory for use by colleges and students in other levels as as well. Are you aware of that? I am. I actually visited there. I, I, I did my master's at Brandeis and, and I started off almost doing VLBI work on quasars. And I remember heading out to visit. This is a long time ago, um, but it, it's it's a it's a wonderful facility. I know one of our scientists has used um, the Haystack um, Observatory, but I, I don't it's not something that we are generally using. This would be a source of radio telescopes to distribute at smaller places. Mm -hmm. It's designed by Alan Rogers. I don't know if you remember that name. No. But he's a super electrical engineer, and he developed this telescope and designed it to be used by un, uh, unexpert people. <laughs> That's that's great. I the nice thing, you know, and that that will be wonderful to tie in with with them. And I'll talk to Vishal, who, as I say, our scientist who's leading this this um, ARDC grant that we hope is going to be renewed. Um, uh, software defined radio, which is basically building a radio uh, receiver in your your computer, is is a wonderfully accessible. It's all it's all um, open source software. And the ability then, you know, once you have a, a source and you can certainly attach antennae just, just to the, you know, the dongle on, on, on the end of your, your laptop, it's a wonderful way to, to learn about um, radio astronomy and radio communications. I mean, it, it's, it's broader than radio astronomy. It's, it's, uh, there's, there's lots of, you know, obviously 
um, different aspects for, for radio technology and communication. But um, tying in with a source, uh, a real source uh, would, would be fabulous uh, beyond the, the ATA. I'll, I'll have a chat with our, our radio people. Thank you. Frank. Uh, quickly, though, you did remind me of something. Do you know if Paul Horowitz's optical search is still ongoing? That was based out at uh, Oak Ridge. <laughs> was the only functioning one for a while. But the second question was even more important was, what is the future of NCC in your mind? What's the next step other than expands, expanding? What other services and support? So yes, I squeezed in two questions. That's what I said. Well, well done, well done. Um, first one, uh, I don't know about um, um, Paul's experiment at the moment. We we have a, a program running called Laser SETI, which is um, an all sky um, survey for for uh, laser pulses um, with a very fast readout time. So you can you can sort of distinguish sort of um, information from those. And that that was a crowdsourced on a GoFundMe was developed as a sort of thirty thousand um, uh, dollar facility, which is basically wide angle SLRs, you know, and, 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 and sophisticated software. But, uh, so laser or, or optical SETI is picking up a bit. There's something at Lick Observatory as well, that's being run out of UC Santa Cruz, but I, I don't know if, if Paul's one is, is running at the moment. NCCN is- I could answer your first question. Oh, yeah. I don't think Paul has been involved with his laser uh, telescope for several, several years at least okay thanks everyone for, N <laughs> for uh, nccn that's a very good question we we feel and um and we've been told that this is this is a uh, a network that is is appreciated by by community college instructors and and if, if the stats are true that there are uh, 700 colleges um, teaching introductory astronomy, then we've only just sort of uh, begun, um, you know, uh, uh, collecting partners. And there's a long way to go. Nevertheless, uh, NASA to fund a, a, uh, uh, a continuation of a program uh, looks at ways that can expand and have broader reach. And we have some ideas on that. Uh, but we would really, uh, we hope that uh, we can continue the program beyond um, uh, 2025 at the moment uh, in various ways. We we, ha we have some ideas, some a cunning plan. <laughs> so I think um, uh, being mindful of the time, we're we're uh, quite a bit past noon, but I want to thank Simon again for um, one, getting up early and two, a, such a fascinating talk. And And we would love to have you back to um, report out on your first contact uh, matrix game yes. simulation. So I did post in the chat the link uh, where we will put this talk and it's um, all of our other talks as well. So I'm gonna stop the recording.